Welcome back. Mike from Canavan Wealth here. Today we are talking about artificial intelligence in the financial services industry. This is a topic that we've covered quite a bit on the channel, specifically ChatGPT. We're going to talk about kind of a, a more broad spectrum of artificial intelligence, what's coming down the road, from my opinion. Uh, this was actually requested by my marketing manager. I am super excited to do it. So thank you for the prompting. Let's jump into it. First of all, do I have any qualifications whatsoever to be talking about artificial intelligence in the financial services industry? Probably not, but no one really uh, follows any of those rules on YouTube. I have been in the financial services industry for about 10 years now. I do code uh, as a hobby effectively, and that caused me to take this course. Uh, this Berkeley FinTech Bootcamp is about a six month course. It says UC Berkeley, but it's really through this kind of uh, for-profit company that does these kind of career preparation courses. I wasn't looking to change careers. I was just really interested in the subject matter and was kind of working on a coding project that I thought this course would help with. Not to mention it was about fintech, you know, disruptive technologies in the financial space. So in this course, we talked about a third of it was on artificial intelligence, deep learning, and topic similar to that. Another part was on blockchain technology, which is the technology that underlies cryptocurrencies. And then about a third of the course was also on kind of traditional coding, specifically the Python language and how it's used and many of the kind of resources that financial analysts use in a modern analyst setting. Okay, so I do have a very minor background in artificial intelligence and obviously years in the financial services industry running my practice and doing planning for clients. So uh, whether you think that qualifies me to talk about it or not, you decide whether you want to turn off the video now or not. So the first thing I want to cover is the difference between artificial intelligence and like traditional programming. What in the financial services industry uh, is would be called robo-advisors. So when my marketing uh, person, Casey, told me to do this topic, their question was really, you know, how do you think artificial intelligence, chat GPT is going to change your job? Are you worried about losing your job to, to an artificial intelligence? So what, why, how is artificial intelligence different than traditional programming in our sector, what we've typically called robo advisors? And that's a very interesting question. And I think you have to understand how the programs are built uh, in order to understand it, there is very subtle differences. So a typical program, specifically one that's going to design to be giving people financial advice, the programmer starts with a set of inputs and knows what output they want to give, right? So we're going to take in this person's financial information, and then we want it to spit out some result. And then they very specifically code it to give that result almost in like a flow chart in that we're going to start by taking their net worth and then we're going to take how many years they have from retirement and then we're going to compare it on some chart and then we're going to take these other inputs and, and provide a planned output that, that you effectively know. I know if I put in these inputs, the other end I will get an output is what I expect that is good financial advice for a client so that anyone could kind of come up to this program input something, and we know what it's going to spit out. Artificial intelligence, although that is an incredibly broad category, but something that uses some type of machine learning typically, is going to go about that a different way. They're going to have that same input data, and they're going to know what they want to come out of the program, but they're going to code the program in a way that the program can effectively change itself in order to predict what the output is supposed to be. So effectively, you pass it a bunch of input, knowing what you want the output to be. Program effectively, kind of in an evolutionary way, guesses at what the output is, and then you tell it whether it was wrong or right, and you keep feeding it data until it correctly guesses the output that you want over and over in some iterative process, in the hopes that when you finally provide it a data set that you don't know what the answer is, it is going to tell you what it is. And I'm going to give you a good example of this in a couple of slides when we talk about where I expect artificial and the financial services industry to be in 10 years. Uh, so how does the AI already affect our industry? Well, for years, we've had 
robo advisors, which I told just told you are not artificial intelligence. These are simply programs that we code to provide an output. They have become very popular with virtually every company that runs a 401k or something like that. They provide some type of program that will ask you some questions and give you basic financial advice about how much you should be saving, how much income you'll have in retirement, things along those lines. So that's been around forever. Analysts and planners, these are you know planners like me who work with individuals, analysts who run mutual funds and things like that, they already use both traditional programming and artificial intelligence to help them interpret data. And I suspect artificial intelligence will continue to do that, reducing headcount when it comes to analysts and planners. Uh, in order to provide that same output, you will need less people interpreting it. And I think the best way to to explain how that's going to be is often how I express what I expect the medical community to look like in probably way less than 10 years, but how is artificial intelligence going to change your experience with a doctor? Right now, a doctor can talk to you and, and answer all the questions, and then they can go online and kind of search for what they think might be ailing you, or if they need some additional information, they can search for that. The way artificial intelligence, I think, is going to change that is they are going to talk to you, and then they're going to go to an artificial intelligence, and they're going to put in all of your case information. And then the artificial intelligence is going to tell them what it thinks. Right? Well, it could be these things. And then that doctor, with their own knowledge of medical, is and knowing what they put into it, which is very important, can then take that output and be like, it's probably not this, it's probably not this. Ooh, this is something I hadn't thought of. Maybe it is because... Maybe I'm not familiar with a recent article that came out that the artificial intelligence is, right? But exactly how that output is being given to the doctor is not known necessarily even by the person who wrote the code to provide it, right? Because of this iterative process where it effectively learns how to learn. So that's, I think, a lot how analysts are going to start using artificial intelligence. They're going to be providing the input, and then using the output to help themselves make decisions, right? Is this going to translate to providing actual advice? And by actual advice, I mean, how long will it be before we ask an artificial intelligence, I just type a paragraph about what my financial situation is, and the artificial intelligence can turn around and tell me a full financial plan, a full way to deal with estate, you know, uh, survivorship for when your spouse passes, everything about retirement, you get like a full customized plan. How far are we from that? Um, we may not be that far from it actually being able to provide that output. I think from compliance reasons, we are quite a ways away from people being able to charge for that. So uh, they may be able to provide it for free on a kind of entertainment or educational purposes only, which you, you see that phrase a lot in the financial services industry, because all of the liabilities that come around when someone gets paid for advice. And now, so this is, is this me talking about effectively you'll be able to get all this information for free? No, I don't think that's also going to be the case. And it's not because they're not willing to give it to you for free. It's because of all of the liability reasons of when you design something that gives people advice that pertains to their entire life savings, it better be good advice, right? And as we've seen with robo-advisors and things like target date retirement funds, whenever we build something for the generation, for the uh, population as a whole, it always has to serve that least common denominator, the most conservative of them, and typically that advice is overly conservative, and could I just say not very imaginative, right? I highly doubt it's going to be giving people advice about IRA to Roth conversions, gifting, and, and very specific things because of the liability that comes with those things that there's no one kind of validating that that is in fact a good situation for this person, that the input they provided was adequate to give them a good output. Will it eventually get there? I have no doubt that it will, but I don't think it's going to happen any faster than any other industry. It kind of gets me to my next point. 
So, which I'll come, well, a point coming up in a minute. Okay, so how is AI going to affect the investment world? I put it in all caps here. It's going to be major, just like everything else, right? There's going to be massive changes to the investment world. It's like the world in general to artificial intelligence. So I want to pull up this article from the Wall Street Journal. This is uh, Gary Gensler, very polarizing figure. Uh, he runs the SEC. You know, he's effectively saying that the next financial crisis could come from AI. Uh, and although there's plenty of things I disagree with Gary Gensler on, I couldn't agree more. The stock market is going to be affected in ways that we cannot predict by artificial intelligence. And just like we didn't see the 2008 global financial crisis coming, at least 98% of us, uh, these most recent troubles with inflation and interest, although it seems like we should have seen it all coming, we didn't. Whatever it is that's going to come, I think it's going to be based on index-based investing and its combination with artificial intelligence. That's going to be, it's going to cause a problem in the future. It terrifies me, but it's not something that I can plan or predict around. So. We just have to do our best when we, you know, kind of keeping this in mind. So we have no chance of predicting how that will work. But the investing world in 10 to 15 years is going to be fundamentally different. And here's, so if I had to guess at what it is, which is probably not going to be accurate, but where it might start, I would say, is going to be this. Someone is going to build some type of a learning platform that goes out and looks at the thousand most trafficked URLs in the world or maybe in the US or whatever it is, it's going to read those websites, whatever it, you know, whatever it's getting from them, it's getting. And it's going to try and predict what the S&P 500 does. And then every day, it's going to learn what the S&P 500 actually did. And it's slowly going to be able to interpret kind of the internet as a whole and guess, and, and then it's going to guess what the S&P 500 does. And if we just say that the S&P 500 has a 50-50 chance of going up or down, Kind of coin flip. If that computer learning model can predict it 5% better than that coin flip, then that is the holy grail of investing, right? If you can, if you can get a 5% edge on what the S&P 500 is going to do every day, it will dramatically affect investing, right? That will change everything. And then we will, and then that of course will Eventually, everyone will start doing that, and then it won't work anymore, and we'll have to start building different models. I mean, we go on and on about you know what the ripples of that would be. It wouldn't last forever, but um, so that's where I see the financial services industry when it comes to the investment world, mutual funds, ETFs. Am I worried about artificial intelligence coming and taking my job as a flesh and blood financial advisor? Eventually, probably, but as you see, I, I don't think it's any worse than any other job. Why is that? Number one is that we've been told our entire careers that you know programmers were coming for us, that the need for flesh and blood financial advisors would eventually go away, which probably every industry has been told this. And it simply has not materialized, right? The need for flesh and blood financial advisors has dramatically dropped from, let's say, the mid-90s, really before the modern internet as we know it, and now because... Back in the 80s and 90s, you had to work with a financial advisor if you wanted access to even remotely good investments. That's just how the industry worked. But as all sorts of online brokerages and access to you know, the internet has changed, you don't have to work with a financial advisor anymore. In fact, for many young people, there's really no need to. So let's say your average person doesn't really feel the need to start working with a financial advisor until they're in their 50s and 60s when they have to start making very important planning decisions. And then even then, a lot of them feel like they can do it on their own because they have access to good information. So let's say the need for financial advisors has been cut to 30% of what it used to be. You would think like, ooh, that would be devastating the industry. Yes, but that's because most people don't understand what is happening to the supply of flesh and blood financial advisors, which, by my estimation, is virtually zero. Um, so now we'll start talking about how I got into the industry and how your average financial advisor gets into the industry, the average age of a financial advisor. So if you look all over the internet and ask, what is the average age of, an, of a financial advisor in the U.S., you'll find out the answer somewhere around 55. Some websites will tell you it's low as 44, but then when you start comparing 
the other statistics they have about financial advisors, like medium income and things like that, you can tell they are not talking about flesh and blood financial advisors. They're typically talking about advisors that are working for some type of a company, like a corporate entity that are doing fairly low level advising. Uh, not flesh and blood, in-person, independent advisors, like most people associate with a flesh and blood advisor. In fact, I think the 55 number is skewed towards that as well. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. And as I look around town, you know, Jake and I have a partner, Jake, who uh, owns the building and he's just a year or two younger than me. We are the only young guys in town. I'm 42. Uh, and, and then you have to understand what happened in the industry about four to five years ago when some rules came out that on paper sounded very good. And we're, I think, you know, largely a positive for, for, the, uh, for the industry, which is they got rid of any type of a sales incentive where you're not allowed to effectively incentivize advisors for selling certain products, which on paper sounds fantastic and quite frankly is in 90% of its application is spot on. It really didn't affect my world because I worked as an independent, so I don't really, didn't really work with these companies. However, in a backwards way, it got rid of every way that new, that financial advising firms made it possible for new advisors to come into the industry, in my opinion, in the right way, which was not selling commission-based products where you earn some big fat paycheck on when you sell some product. It allows them to come into the industry in the right way in a fee-based kind of asset management planning. Uh, that could be, it's a whole loan video I'm not going to go into. So what happened about four to five years ago is all the companies like Waddle and Reed doesn't exist anymore, but that's the company that I came in with. Raymond James is still around, and there's a couple other uh, companies that were they they stopped making new advisors because they just figured out there's just no way to get these guys and gals into the industry without some type of assistance. And now they just steal them from each other. Right? Every firm is just fighting to get the advisors to come work with them versus their old firm. The one holdout there is still Edward Jones. Edward Jones, uh, again, this could be a whole video in and of itself. Edward Jones has a totally different business model than most other advisory firms like LPL, Raymond James, things like that. And they do still make flesh and blood financial advisors. But to my knowledge, they are pretty much the only one. Everyone else now, if you want to get into the industry, you have to find an advisor typically who's already in the business and kind of come in under them. Uh, and even that is extremely difficult to do. There's an incredibly high washout rate for new financial advisors. There's just not a lot of people coming into the industry. So even if the need for financial advisors has is 30% of what it used to be 20 years ago, and in 10 years, because of artificial intelligence, is going to be another 30% of what it used to be, when the supply is near zero, it doesn't matter how much the demand is diminishing because... I, you know, I often tell, I've worked with a number of kind of advertisers, TV, you know, radio and things along those lines. And they say like, how do you want to distinguish yourself from your competition? And I always kind of chuckle and tell them like, what competition are you talking about? The vast majority of clients I talk with, they're not like shopping around for financial advisors. They're just trying to find someone they think that they can trust that is willing to take them on, that they get a sense, like actually knows what they're doing. And your average financial advisor who is, you know, kind of knows what they do. They fill up quick. They're not out there, you know, pounding the pavement for, for, for new clients, um, except in very specific ways, like talking about generational planning and things. Um, so it's, I'm not worried about the, the need for financial advisor drive just because there's, there's very little supply in the world and very few people get into the industry. Virtually all of the advisors I know are working on their retirement, their exit strategy. And their exit strategy is not to bring someone new into the industry to try and get them to take over their business because the risk of them failing is just so high. They want someone else to buy their business. And, you know, it, eventually you get to the point where you, as a younger advisor in the industry, you stop looking at wanting to buy books because there's liability for you as well. Um, so, 
this industry is going to go through a reckoning in about 10 years caused by the changes we made five years ago. Good changes for 95% of the chance. It was just this kind of outlier case that uh, had unintended consequences. All right, I've rambled on about that enough. The hard part of what I do is not the planning, knowing what to do, what to tell the client. This is so. This is the other reason why I'm not worried about taking my job because that's not the hard part of what I do, which is what artificial intelligence will come for first, which is telling you what investments to be in, you know, what things should you do in order to get ready for retirement. That's the easy part. The hard part in this industry is building trust. It's what I tell, you know, I've, I've been looking for junior advisors that I can trust and who I think can do the job for many years to varying degrees of success. And this is what I always tell them, your job, they often say like, I don't have any experience with investments. And I'm like, that's the easy part. I can do the investments for you and I can teach you the planning. The, the real hard part is teaching people to trust you. Why is teaching, getting people to trust you so hard? This is going to be the hot take of the video. And it's extremely blunt. It's because you should not trust the financial services industry. There are too many bad actors in it. And by bad actors, I do not mean intentionally malevolent forces. The number of people I've run across in the financial services industry who are just greedy, who are just doing it to make as much money as possible, is surprisingly low. Right? This is not the financial services industry should not be trusted not because they are actively trying to just squeeze as much money out of you. So, so why is it? It's a couple of reasons. One is that there are just a lot of companies out there that are trying to sell a product to everyone, despite the fact that not everyone needs it. And this is how human nature works, right? If you sell Ford Explorers, or purses, no one is surprised that you're trying to sell a Ford Explorer or purse to absolutely everyone that you come across because the consumer understands that they have to make the value decision in their head as to whether the, they want a Ford Explorer or a purse, right? But the financial services industry is so complicated that it is very tough for many consumers to understand whether they need the product that many companies are selling. And we oddly, unlike almost every other industry, have standards by which we have to self-police whether we sell products to people based on whether they actually need it or it is in their best interest. and. That is a recipe for disaster, in my opinion, because it's just paperwork, right? This like proof that they need it or their best interest largely in this world just comes down to tons and tons of disclosures. And you got to sign your life away every time you buy something. I don't think the, where the actual rubber meets the road, the industry does a very good job of it. So you, you have to find someone that you can trust that is not going to put you in many of those products or situations or whatever it is. It's... The other one is that unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are not capable of doing the job or incompetent because there is so little supply. Anyone that reaches a certain level of success in the industry automatically becomes successful because people are always looking for a decent financial advisor. Sometimes they find one, they're just not a decent one. Um, so that's it, you know, that. And then the other thing about building trust is that. And why I'm not worried about AI coming for my job specifically is that I'm always going to work with people generally who are my age or older, which means they have comfort with technology similar to me or less, right? So 10 years from now, 20 and 30 year olds may have grown up in a world with artificial intelligence, and it may be totally normal for them to trust their investment decisions to asking a computer a computer that is coded in a way that even the coder doesn't know how it works and getting an answer and following that. It is unlikely that people my age or older will ever be that comfortable with it, right? People nowadays certainly have a comfort level with the internet and whatnot, but they still come to flesh and blood financial advisors to get advice. So, you know, it, it, it will come to a certain level. Will there be generations after me where, Artificial intelligence could replace us when it comes to building trust. 
Absolutely. But when we're at that point, it's nothing to do with whether I'm a financial advisor, a doctor, a lawyer, any of these things are then replaceable by artificial intelligence. So you know, it doesn't worry me. Just kind of you know back to here, just kind of the wrap up here of financial services. It's absolutely going to affect the stock market, the way the financial services industry works, just like everything else. There's not going to be anything 10 years from now that is not dramatically changed by the new artificial intelligences that are starting to hit and you know affect the world. And but am I worried that uh, my job is any more susceptible to another person's job when it comes to artificial intelligence? You know, kind of a traditional white collar job. No, you know, estate attorneys will start going out of business about the same time that finance, flesh and blood financial advisors will, specifically because our job is about the human connection of finance, dealing with your family, and those important decisions that you know are kind of life altering for you, which I'm not that worried that a computer is going to replace me, you know, in that aspect. So um, that's really it. If you like the video, please like it, subscribe if you want to see similar content. I hope it's been informative. I will talk to you soon. Thank you.